All right, it's 11.15 and we're going to move on to Michelle, I believe is with us this morning. Is that correct? Yes, I am, Senator, oh, thank you. Morning. All right, okay, here we go. So I am going to share my screen. I've got a presentation to give you an update on the status of our planning for um, more extensive engagement um, to bring additional equity to our planning and uh, project um, selection processes and how we deliver those. So let me just get my presentation queued up here. Uh, Michelle, this is related to the, um, the four page report that we just received. Um, that would be it. Um, yeah. Gives us an approach and then the status update. Yes. That is okay. correct, All right. Senator. All right. Oh, I shouldn't have bothered to read it if you were going to present it to us. Sorry. <laughs> well, we keep well, telling that, Jane. You don't, you don't listen to us. You want to read everything. You know, you know, you like yeah. to read. We, we never know who's going to read those reports, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> you'll recall last session that uh, there was a requirement in the T bill that we move forward with an equity framework. Um, and uh, provide a report to you, which initially we were thinking would be the actual product of um, this process. But it turns out this is um, much more involved than we had anticipated and the timeline is uh, now different than we uh, originally expected. Um, so in addition, simultaneously, the at the federal level, last January, um, the Biden administration issued uh, what's called the Justice 40 um, executive order. And this um, is will have requirements that states invest 40% of their um, of their federal investments um, and that those investments flow to disadvantaged communities. And the guidance on that is still under development. We're not exactly sure what that will mean for Vermont. Um, I think in Vermont, um, the characterization of disadvantaged communities would likely include the lower income communities throughout the state, uh, you know, might be sort of income based, as well as other um, specific uh, census block communities of um, folks who are historically um, disadvantaged um, in their participation or their receipt of benefits uh, from federal programs. So this is something we're still monitoring and we'll be incorporating into our process. Uh, when we think about equity and transportation, um, I like to use this um, this block, which um, really talks about the different kinds of equity. So, you know, we have basic inequality where we have unequal access to opportunities, which is shown up the top with um, a person who has a terrible road and, and can't sort of get from here to there versus somebody who's provided a, a nice highway. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, are we making sure that when we do um, provide equitable access that we are providing that in, across um, the geographies and across um, the different uh, user communities. And then social equity um, to sort of identify and address these inequalities. So being able to understand um, the, the sort of foundations of why there is inequity. And then Ultimately, we arrive at a sort of a point of justice, it may be called, to, um, to assure that we are uh, using appropriate tools and approaches so that we um, are able to distribute the, the resources that we're charged with in, in an equitable manner. Okay. So um, we have um, moved forward. Um, and selected a consultant after a pretty lengthy um, process to develop a request for proposals, which included um, consultation with the both sort of agency and regional planning commission um, partners, as well as um, the state um, equity uh, director and also our federal highway administration uh, director. And I think I might have a slide on that later, but. Um, it is a <clears throat> multi-layered team. Um, the consultant that was selected is Resource Systems Group, um, which brought together um, both a good 
internal team as well as uh, bringing forth the Rights and Democracy Institute, Kaya Morris, <clears throat> who many of you may have heard of. She worked um, on the climate planning process um, and um, has assembled a team who is working now also with the Agency of Natural Resources on some of their equity uh, advancement. So I think that that will be, uh, she'll bring some good insights into this process. The way we are setting this up is that um, we'll do the initial um, project initiation and research, examine existing pro programs and, um, and pre prepare an assessment of where we stand. And then we will have um, a, a very lengthy stakeholder and public involvement process, which will be led by the Rights and Democracy Institute. And there will be um, very focused um, research and, and outreach to specific types of marginalized communities to help us form the basis for how we would engage with these communities across the state going forward. Um, so the Bennington BIPOC community, Winooski Burlington, second generation New Americans, uh, urbanized uh, residents within Barrie and Newport and Rut Rutland area um, persons experiencing low income. And there will be a whole range of, of engagement strategies that um, to, to, uh, the rights and democracy and, Democracy Institute have uh, utilized successfully. Um, we do have some um, pretty good um, information available to us on this topic now. Um, this is a, a, an index prepared by UVM um, School of Natural Resources, uh, Rubenstein, Rubenstein School, and it basically looks at um, environmental disparity. And there's a variety of tools, um, not only here in Vermont, but that are evolving nationally. Here's another um, equity index created by um, the um, Oregon Department of Transportation's Office of Social Equity. And so we will be looking at, um, at utilizing and then enhancing or developing similar tools for our efforts. And um, you'll have this slide in your in your packet. I'm not going to dwell on it, but um, sure, it's Martha. basic. Okay. Yes, Michelle, I think you think the slides are advancing, but all I'm seeing is the same slide: inequity, equality, social equity, and justice. Oh is, dear. Am I unique in that, or? Yeah, that's, that's all I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me go. I don't know what's happening here. Let me um, let me go to another framework here. Um, if you have two screens, you might just be looking at the screen with your PowerPoint. Oh, I see that. Yeah, somehow I um, am having, I'm going to stop sharing and get this straightened out. What are you seeing, Senator Chittenden? Now, yeah, there's better. Oh, now we're seeing nothing. each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try this again and see if I can't get this up. Um, Thank you for letting me know about that, Senator Chittenden. Yeah, I, I really had some great slides for you to see, but. <laughs> okay, let's start sharing again. Okay, are the slides advancing now? Yes. Okay, so those are all the slides that I showed you before that you didn't see. They'll be on your website, but they're just depictions of, um, of the, the, the resources that are available. And then, um, you know, we will be working on a vision statement and guiding principles um, that will help inform how we advance this and how we apply it to our work. And then the final report will basically be a compilation of all of the research and um, will result in best practices, recommendations, and uh, methods for implementing the plan. And this planning process will apply to everything from our, um, our public outreach to identify uh, projects that may be needed in a region or a community all the way to um, scoping processes where we engage uh, um, the public in 
um, the design concepts for projects, the uh, 502 hearing where we're bringing out information related to um, the sort of near final designs and the right of way implications and and then our on the ground implementation of projects so that we have a, a good way to approach this. Senator Kitchell? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, Michelle, um, uh, the metrics that are gonna have to be developed to um, mm -hmm. uh, comply with the federal requirement that 40% of investments flow to disadvantaged. Um, just take Burlington. You've got, um, uh, uh, within the city of Burlington, you have many neighborhoods. Some are very affluent and some are much um, lower income. And so uh, within your planning, are you gonna have to identify um, and set standards or definitions around I would think you'd have to around um, what is a disadvantaged community and yeah. it's a community um, going to be uh, a subdivision of a town and city. Um, it's just, it, it's when you think about what it takes to implement and report and, you know, for compliance, I, I, I know that certainly you think about historically what we've done when we put interstates through, what do we do? Put it through yeah. the poorest neighborhoods, split them up. We did that with the Boston North End or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, or the um, people who live along a railroad line historically have had um, maybe lower income. So I'm just wondering uh, what you what is the thinking or will the federal government provide those metrics? So I'm anticipating that the federal government will <clears throat> provide um, some guidance relative to the metrics. They've done that with other types of investment requirements that they have placed upon us in terms of maintaining our bridges, our roadways, et cetera. And I expect a similar approach to this. In terms of breaking it down, um, I suspect it's going to be um, really looking sort of the investment side will perhaps be a little different than the outreach side. And um, I can't really speak to the investment side on the Justice 40 piece until we have more guidance. Yeah, because but, it's only certain federal investments. So obviously mm -hmm. there must be identified um, yeah. package of investments that this uh, um, this requirement would apply. And I don't know well, what those certains are. Well, it's, it seems pretty broad from the executive order when I reviewed that. So I'm just, I'm sort of curiously and anxiously awaiting um, more details on that. I mean, I think if you, um, I think compared to other parts of the U.S. where you consider our rural context and, um, and other factors related to income, I would imagine that when we sort of look at our transportation system investments, whether it's transit or roadway or bridge, we're making a lot of investments in communities where there are economic disparities. And then I would expect, you know, we're going to have some acknowledgement of that when the final guidance comes out. In terms of the specific outreach we do relative to our planning and our projects, that would really be more at the sort of neighborhood level, so to speak, um, depending on which um, communities uh, we're delivering services or projects to and how we may need to approach um, the engagement for those processes. All right. Um, so just to give you an idea where we're going with this, um, January, we're gonna kick off this process and start the um, setting up the advisory group. And then May through September will be that intensive community outreach that we uh, had talked about with um, basically later this fall, working on the recommendations of the implementation plan and then having this ready around February of uh, a year from now. So that's, that's the timeline and that's the status of this. And I believe that is my last slide. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any other questions. Questions, anyone? Boy, no okay. questions. Um, the, <laughs> so when you're reviewing a project, then uh, this would just be part of that um, criteria that you would be looking at. Um, yep. In, in that decision making, or that would translate down into probably the RPCs and the tax mm -hmm. as well. Yep. 
Yeah, the RPCs will be an integral partner in this whole process. And I think a lot of the outcomes in terms of where we will need to place more emphasis on engagement and even to the point of, of helping certain communities understand and be ready to participate in our processes. In other words, it's not just knowing that there is a public meeting coming up. It's, you know, okay, there's a public meeting up, coming up and what do these things that the transportation agency are going to be talking about? What do they even mean? How do they, how do they impact me? Um, you know, what concerns should I have? Um, so there's, it's, it's a pretty broad sort of effort. And then for some communities, you know, is there a need to assist by creating a liaison who is from that community who can um, help us in understanding the needs of a particular community? Say if it's a new American community where, um, where they might be impacted by a major roadway project and, and, you know, what are the considerations we're going to have to create to, um, to, to address to make sure that um, they are not impacted in a way we would not intend to impact them if we had not been deliberate about this. Yes, Senator Perkley. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, do you see this impacting the work that's happening today or is it something that the agency is trying to get in place so that for future projects? So today we already have a process um, within our um, public outreach plan to make sure that we are identifying potentially impacted communities when we are doing projects. And a, a good example of that was um, the recent engagement uh, through the NEPA process for the Champlain Parkway for um, communities um, in the sort of north end of that project. So we, we do actively and intentionally use tools now, but we are anticipating that there will be other approaches and perhaps better screening data and better screening processes so that project managers are trained to understand um, what are all the steps they need to be taking uh, to assure that they're addressing these objectives of the agency. Well, I, I understood that. I just want, and I was thinking about that, Champlain. Parkway project, if you mm -hmm. saw this work affecting projects like that, I think you would go back and redo some of the engagement or this is really more going forward. Right, like in that example, the engagement was already redone as part of the NEPA requirement that the ROD be um, the record of decision um, uh, be, um, be re-examined. And so that, that occurred in the Champlain Parkway process. Um, I would say that projects that are underway are not going to sort of be put, placed on pause to um, conduct additional engagement um, because we would uh, assume in particular those that require some sort of NEPA evaluation that we are catching sort of those uh, areas where we need to be doing adequate engagement. Um, to address the concerns that would uh, arise from uh, impacted communities. So, you know, I, I, I don't think we're in a position to say, oh, we're not gonna let things go forward until we make sure we've done this, but where we um, can and where we're early in the processes, we are going to be applying the tools, <clears throat> the, at least the tools we have. Thanks. When did the federal rules become uh, effective? So that Justice 40 executive order became effective last January, um, but it's been a very slow rollout on the guidance. I've attended a couple of webinars put on by the federal agencies overseeing this and at the USDOT, and um, they've been pretty high level. So um, we're still waiting for more details. Questions, comments? Anything else, Michelle? That's it for me today. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Coming thank in. you. Uh, All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else the committee has on uh, the agenda? You'll probably get to have lunch today. <laughs> I've got a meeting <laughs> over <laughs> lunch. Okay. All right. Unless there's anything else, we will see you all tomorrow morning.
at nine o'clock or I'll see you this afternoon.